We now consider the central field approximation. And this is an approximation used for heavier atoms. That means atoms with uh, atomic number uh, much greater than one. Now for uh, an atom like hydrogen atom which has only one electron and a proton, the problem is a two body problem and uh, it can be separated uh, into a problem in the center of mass coordinates and in relative coordinates. And uh, in the center of mass prime of preference, the center of mass will be moving at uh, uh, zero velocity and therefore we can only consider, we can consider only the relative problem in the relative coordinates, uh, which can further be uh, separated in uh, the radial and angular coordinates because the potential involved, that is the Coulomb potential, is spherically symmetric. Uh, for other atoms with low atomic number, for example the helium atom, we were able to use perturbation theory as well as uh, the variational method to find approximate eigenstates and eigenvalues. And as the atomic number become larger and larger, uh, this becomes more and more difficult. And one of the approximations used in that context is the central field approximation, uh, where we assume that each electron is moving in an effective potential created by all charges other than uh, this electron, this particular electron itself. So that means uh, it will include the charges in the nucleus, positive charge in the nucleus and a charge distribution created by all other electrons. And we call it uh, the potential V of R. And further we assume that this potential is spherically symmetrical. That means P as a function of the vector R is simply a, a function only of the radial coordinate R. Then each electron uh, has an effective Hamiltonian given by P square by 2M plus P of R where P is the kinetic the momentum of that electron. Now the single electron states are the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. <laughs> now since uh, all the uh, electrons uh, are identical, the effective Hamiltonian for each of them would be the same and we can use uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution to fill up the electrons in these levels. Now, a word about uh, the electronic states arising from a Hamiltonian like this. First of all, we note that the potential is spherically symmetric and therefore the whole Hamiltonian is also spherically symmetric because P square by 2 the kinetic energy part is already spherically symmetric. Then the eigenstates can be written as the product of a radial function r of r and the spherical harmonics y l m theta phi r will have indices n and l m l now solving the radial part we will get one more quantum number that is n and this is uh, uh, similar to the uh, quantum number that we get in the hydrogen atom case the principal quantum number and we can choose this quantum number such that L will always have values between 0 and L. It can go up to n minus 1. Another thing to notice is that the energy levels arising from this Hamiltonian, that is if you have say H psi n l m equal to E n l m psi n l m, these energy levels depend on both L and M, oh, sorry both N and L. It will be independent of M and that's because of the spherical symmetry and 
the in the case of hydrogen atom the energy depended only on the principal quantum number n and that's a peculiar property of the coulomb interaction but for general uh, central potential this energy depend upon n and l so we can write h psi nlm equal to e nl psi nlm Further, we also have to include the spin state of the electron. Now, the Hamiltonian is independent of the spin operator, and therefore we can write the state of the state of the electron as simply the product psi n l m corresponding to the spatial part of uh, the wave function times chi. Chi is the uh, spin wave function. And we have already seen uh, the uh, wave functions uh, chi, uh, which is represented in terms of the eigenfunctions of say L square, sorry, S square, and this is. The total wave function uh, for uh, the electron should be anti symmetric. And uh, we can choose this product to be anti symmetric in by different uh, combinations, which we have already discussed in earlier classes. The next step is to uh, estimate the central potential field. So, one of the very first uh, attempts is the Thomas Fermi model of the atom. And uh, this uh, Thomas Fermi model is an approximation which becomes better and better as the uh, number of electrons in the big, uh, electrons in the atom become larger and larger. Further, we assume that the central potential V of R is uh, a slowly varying one, so that uh, you know over uh, an electron wavelength, for example. Uh, v of r is approximately constant. It varies so slowly that it will remain constant approximately over an electron wavelength. And we assume that, uh, you know, there are a large number of electrons that are localized in that region. So, for all those electrons, they see uh, the central potential to be approximately constant. So, finding the wave functions of them becomes quite simpler because the Schrodinger equation uh, in that region is like h bar square by 2m del square plus v of r. Now, over this region where lots of electrons are localized, uh, this potential is almost constant and therefore this, is, this can be written as v psi is equal to v psi only in that region. Since it is localized in that region, we can see that psi is uh, not significant outside that region. So, uh, so we are making an approximation whereby we vary so slowly and that there are a large number of electrons there within that within a, within a small region, say corresponding to uh, you know an electron wavelength where uh, the potential can be approximately constant and therefore the Schrodinger equation in that region has the simple form where this potential is almost a constant. And in that case, the uh, the wave functions will go like e to the power i k dot r and further we assume that it is a region of say, uh, suppose a cubical region of volume say L cube where L is the side of the cube. We can also say that the allowed k values are given by uh, say k values are 2 pi by L into uh, say n so that means say k x will have value 2 pi by L n x where n x can take values from 0 to n, L, uh, n minus 1 sorry it can take all values 
uh, integer values and uh, similarly ky can take values 2 pi by l n y and similarly k z. So from this we see that the separation between any two uh, levels for example kx levels is 2 pi by l and similarly the separation between two levels in the y uh, direction is 2 pi by l and the separation in k space between two uh, two k values in the z direction is 2 pi by l. So the volume occupied by one particular k state in the three dimensional k space is 2 pi by l cube. So this is equal to 2 pi cube by l cube but l cube is simply volume of that region. So this is uh, you know something that we need to See. So the approximations involved are that the potential varies very slowly and because of that over a, a length of an electron wavelength where the wave function is appreciably large, uh, we can say that V of R is approximately constant and in that region we further assume that there are large number of electrons localized there. So this would mean that the atom itself has large number of atoms and therefore this approximation becomes good only for systems with large number of electrons. So now in that region say of volume say V, the potential is approximately constant and uh, we can think, think of localized electron states over there and if we assume that you know this region uh, is uh, you know something like a, a cube of uh, say length L and the volume V equal to L cube we could further assume that the separation between two allowed k values are simply given by uh, 2 pi cube by V. So a particular k state occupies an effective volume equal to 2 pi cube by V. Uh, and these levels can now be filled according to the Fermi Dirac statistics. Now assuming that uh, the temperature, the normal uh, temperatures are much much smaller than V of R. This correspond to filling up the energy levels in uh, the order of increasing energy of the levels. And this is because of the following uh, e to the power, the Fermi Dirac distribution is given by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. Now epsilon minus mu by kt when it is uh, for, uh, for epsilon values that are small and for small temperatures beta is a very very large number because beta is equal to 1 by kt and for small temperatures this is so and for energy levels uh, smaller than uh, the chemical potential, uh, the probability of filling of those levels is approximately 1 and for energy levels greater than mu, uh, the probability of filling is approximately 0. And therefore, for temperatures much small compared to the energies involved here, the potential, we can assume uh, that the energy levels are filled in the increasing order of energy. That is uh, energy levels up to the highest energy will be filled and uh, all other levels will be empty. So we consider a region uh, say around uh, the position R of volume delta V over which we, we assume that the potential is almost constant and 
uh, let the highest energy level be given by uh, a momentum P0. And as we know that uh, the energy is simply given by the kinetic energy plus potential energy over here. Since we have states like e to the power i k dot r, the kinetic energy would be h bar square k square by 2m plus v of r. Now, each of these level correspond to a particular value of k and uh, a k value in the k space occupies an approximate volume of 2 pi cube by delta v as we have already seen earlier. Since the volume here uh, is denoted by delta v. Earlier I had said it's V, but now I use delta V to represent the volume in the region where the potential is almost constant. So I can write H bar K as P, then E of K or E of P equivalently equal to P square by 2M plus V of R. Now this V is the potential experienced by the electron at that point, which is the effective central potential that we have been talking about. And since the electronic levels are filled according to the increasing order of energy, the electrons will be filled uh, so that in, it includes all the electrons in the increasing order of energy and let P0 be the maximum momentum or, or the largest momentum state uh, that is filled. To find the number of electrons uh, say in this region of volume delta V around R then we just have to count the number of states corresponding to uh, momentum values up to P0. First we find the number of spatial wave functions uh, you know, that have momentum up to P0. So, this correspond to all K values having value less than K0, uh, which is given as P0 by H bar. And this is obtained first by computing the volume occupied by uh, a sphere of radius K0 in the k space because uh, the absolute value of k should be less than or equal to k0 and this corresponds to a sphere of radius k0 in the k space and that is given by 4 by 3 pi k0 cube. Now this is the volume of k space corresponding to momentum less than p0 or k less than k0. But now we know that every k state corresponding to the electronic states have a volume 2 pi q by delta v and therefore the number of k levels with k values less than k0 is simply this volume divided by the volume occupied by a single state. So that is 2 pi q by delta v. Rearranging we get that equal to delta v by 6 pi square p0 by h bar q. Now we also know that uh, the electrons have spin half and therefore for each state, uh, each k state given here, there will be two spin states available. So the total number of electronic states available per unit volume will be equal to two times this number divided by the volume. So two times n r divided by delta v and that becomes 1 by 3 pi, pi square p0 by h bar q. Now we need to estimate what p0 is that is the maximum momentum maximum value of momentum uh, that uh, the filled state can have. And this is given by the total energy equal to zero because total energy greater than zero means the electron is free from the atom. So for an electron bound to the atom, uh, P square by 2M plus V of R should be less than zero. Or in other words, P 
should be less than or equal to square root of minus 2 mvr. And this is what our P0 is. Now you can see that P0 depends upon R. So for every point R and for a region of volume say delta V around it, we can say that there are uh, levels given by say e to the power i k dot r with momentum or momentum less than uh, say p0 which depends upon r and is given by minus square root of 2 m v r. So that is what I have described over here. Therefore, the number density of electrons at a particular point R can now be given by 1 by 3 p square p0 by h bar q and replacing p0 with minus 2 me uh, vr to the power half, we get n of r is equal to 3 pi square h bar q minus 2 mvr to the power 3 by 2. Now, from this expression, we immediately see that n of r now depends only on the radial coordinate r. That's because uh, the potential is central. Now, we see uh, the asymptotic form of uh, the potential, central potential uh, that we use. Now, as r tend to 0, that is we are close to the nucleus, the dominant contribution to Vr comes only from the nucleus and which is given by minus 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught z e square by r. So the form of V as r tend to 0 is simply given by this equation. Now z is the atomic number. Now as r tend to infinity, a test positive charge sees the atom as a neutral one. Now, if the atom had some charge, the potential will fall off like, say, V of R going like, say, 1 by R multiplied by, you know, a factor depending upon the charge. But outside the atom, since the atom as a whole is neutral, the potential will fall off at a rate much larger than 1 by r or in other words if we take r times v r and r tend to infinity this goes to zero because v of r falls off to zero at a much faster rate than r and this is because outside the atom the total charge is zero and therefore uh, uh, no, the atom can now be considered as a neutral object and uh, any potential that uh, is seen outside will come from uh, the charge distribution within itself but not simply as a whole uh, effective charge. Now, given an electron density, since each electron has a charge minus E, uh, this corresponds to a charge density given by charge times the electron density, number density of electrons. So rho of R is equal to minus E times N of R. And the electric potential phi of R is related to the potential energy by the following equation. So, V of R, the potential is equal to the charge times phi of R. So, potential energy equal to charge times electrostatic potential. Now, here Q equal to minus E and therefore, we get phi of R equal to minus V of R divided by E. 
and given the charge density and the electrostatic potential they are related by the Poisson equation which says that del square phi is equal to minus rho charge density by epsilon naught and substituting for phi over there in terms of the potential we have del square v of r equal to minus e square n r by epsilon zero. Now v depends only on the radial coordinate and uh, this Laplacian in the uh, uh, in the spherical polar coordinate will have a derivatives with respect to the radial coordinate and the angular coordinates. Now over here derivative with respect to the angular coordinates will be zero because v does not depend on the angles and therefore the Laplacian here simply becomes 1 by r square d by dr r square dv by dr equal to whatever is there on the right hand side. Now substituting for n r from our earlier formula we get this equation. Now we know that as r tend to 0, v of r is like minus z e square by 4 pi epsilon naught r and therefore we define a new dimensionless quantity which is v of r divided by this. So minus z e square by 4 pi epsilon naught and we will call it chi of r. In terms of chi of r, v of r equal to minus z d square by 4 pi epsilon naught r times chi of r. So as r tend to infinity, since v tend to minus z d square by 4 pi epsilon naught r, chi tend to 1. And uh, so chi r tend to 0 is 1 and chi r tend to infinity is 0 because v of r as r tend to infinity is already 0. And not just that, r times v of r as r tend to infinity is also 0 and therefore chi of r as r tend to infinity is uh, say minus 4 pi epsilon naught by z d square times r times v of r which go to 0 as r tend to infinity. Now, uh, in terms of chi, uh, this equation can be rewritten in this form simply by substituting for uh, V of R. And a further simplification involving these derivatives straight away leads to the equation in terms of derivatives of chi, d square chi by dr square equal to uh, this factor times chi to the power 3 by 2 by r to the power 3 by 2. Further, we can replace r in terms of uh, a dimensionless variable x by the scaling r is equal to b times x where b has dimensions of r length. And we write chi of r equal to chi tilde of x. So that means chi of r equal to chi tilde of x equal to chi tilde of x is r by b. Or in other words, chi at tilde of x is equal to chi of r which is b of x. Now using this, we can write the derivative with respect to r in terms of derivative with respect to x and it simplifies to d square chi by dx square equal to chi to the power 3 by 2 uh, by x to the power half provided we choose this factor appearing over here to be equal to 1 which simplifies into b being equal to this factor 
and simplifying it further b equal to half 3 pi by 4 to the power 2 by 3 then a0 by z to the power 1 by 3 where a0 is a bore radius and it's given by 4 pi epsilon naught times h bar square by m e square. Now putting in all the values over here we will get b is approximately equal to 0.885 a0 by z to the power 1 by 3 and the equation now becomes d square chi tilde by dx square equal to chi tilde to the power 3 by 2 by x to the power half and as we have already seen the uh, boundary conditions are chi tilde 0 so chi tilde x is equal to chi of r which is b of x now chi tilde 0 equal to chi 0 but chi 0 was uh, already seen to be equal to 1 so the boundary condition at 0 is chi tilde 0 is 1 and further chi tilde at infinity is equal to chi at b times infinity which is infinity now chi at infinity is 0 and therefore chi tilde as x tend to infinity is also 0 so we need to solve the equation 5.2 with the boundary conditions that chi tilde is 1 at x equal to 0 and 0 at x equal to infinity Now we have already seen that chi of r equal to chi of chi tilde of x and uh, r is equal to b of x and therefore uh, chi tilde of x is equal to chi tilde of in terms of r x is equal to r by And from which we can compute uh, the central potential V of R by the formula that we have already seen equal chi R times minus Z D square by 4 pi epsilon of R. And once we know V of R, the electron density can be computed like 1 by 3 pi square H cube, then minus 2 mv R to the power 3 by 2. Now we have uh, a second method uh, for finding the central fields and it's called the Hartree self-consistent method. Uh, in this method we assume that the potential experienced by the ith electron is due to uh, first of all the nuclear charge and which is given by say uri equal to minus 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught times z e square by ri and secondly due to an effective charge density because of all other electrons other than the ith electron so if the single particle state the jth electron is in is assumed to be uh, say given by phi j then the charge density contributed by it is simply the charge times the probability density of that electron and since the electron is in the state phi j and the corresponding probability density is given by phi j mod square and the charge density therefore will be given by minus e times uh, phi j mod square now the total charge density created by all other electrons the electrons other than the ith electron will be the sum of the charge density due to each of them and it is given by sum over j where j is not equal to i rho j r which is given by minus e times sum over j not equal to i phi j mod square where we have substituted this equation for rho j. So if we are given a charge density rho r then the potential at say a position ri due to this charge density and we call it v2 is given by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught uh, so phi at say ri 
is given by say 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught dr dash then rho r dash by r i minus r dash absolute value. Now the potential energy experienced by the electron is equal to its charge times the potential. So this let me call it as uh, some other say phi the potential electrostatic potential. The charge times is electrostatic potential which is given by minus E times this and therefore the potential energy experienced by the ith electron due to the charge distribution corresponding to all other electrons other than uh, the ith electron is simply minus E times this factor which is nothing but this equation. <coughs> And substituting for rho from this equation, we get this equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught sum over j naught equal to i dr dash e square mod square of phi j divided by r i minus r dash absolute value. Now in each term over here, we have an integral over dr dash, but r dash is an integration variable. So I can call it by any name, for example, I can call it by say dj, drj and replace all this r dash by rj here, it will not matter. And doing that, I will get this equation v2 ri equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught sum over j naught equal to i integral over drj e square phi j rj mod square by ri minus rj. So, which can be written in the following form, you have this mod square of phi j here and v r i r j, where we define v r i r j to be precisely the other terms over here, which is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught e square by r i minus r j, which is the electrostatic uh, interaction between the ith and jth electron. Now, the total potential seen by the electron is u r i plus v 2 r i. So, which substituting for v 2 r i from this is simply given by u r i plus sum over j naught equal to i v r i r j phi j r j mod square. We should now note that this potential that is seen by the ith electron is not spherically symmetric as such and we will get the central potential or the spherically symmetric potential by averaging this potential over the angular variables of the ith electron. Now the single particle Schrodinger equation reads minus h bar square by 2m del square plus v of r where v of r is this whole potential times phi i r equal to epsilon i phi i r where epsilon i are the single particle energies and phi i r are the single particle states. Now this equation uh, should be solved self consistently. The reason is the following. Uh, phi i are the solutions of this equation, the Schrodinger equation. But the potential appearing here that is v of r is given by equation 7.4 and that involves a term with summation over j phi j r j mod square. So to find this potential we need to know all phi j's other than i, uh, other than phi i. But phi j is a solution of an equation like this. So to know, to find phi j we need to know potential and to know potential we need to know all values of phi j. So this equation 7.0 and 7.5 can be solved together only or in a self-consistent manner. That if we assume a potential V of R and get a solution uh, say phi i for each i and then we substitute that value of phi, phi i's in this equation computing the potential, we should get the potential we used here back. 
So this is what is called self-consistently solving this equation. Now, so this is a single particle energy levels at electron C's. But now if we want to find the total energy of the n electron atom, we simply cannot add up all these electron levels. That is because this V of R involves sum over J, V, R, I, R, J, because they are all the pair interaction potentials. Now, when we add this over I with J not equal to I, we see that we are actually summing over this potential energy twice. So, sum over I epsilon I include this contribution from the electrostatic repulsion between the electron pairs twice. So, we have to substitute one such contribution, uh, we have to subtract a contribution uh, from one, uh, one pair, sorry, one set of pairs from the total energy. So that is obtained the following way. So the total energy is given by sum over I epsilon I minus sum over I not equal to J, then this. So this is the contribution to the energy from all pairs I and J with I not equal to J. Now I am subtracting half of it. So that uh, uh, when uh, this much is subtracted from sum over I epsilon I, uh, each pair will contribute only once uh, to this total energy. Now, this Hartree equations, uh, so by the way, these equations are called the Hartree equations. Now, these Hartree equations can also be obtained using the variation principle. And for this, we see that the Hamiltonian is given by minus h bar square by 2m del i square plus u of ri, where u of ri is uh, the uh, interaction potential that the electron has with the nucleus plus half sum over i not equal to j v r i r j the pair repulsion interaction energy between the electrons which we may write as sum over i running from 1 to n h of r i where h of r i is simply this term corresponding to the ith electron and has the general form minus h bar square by 2m del square plus u of r plus this pair interaction energy. Now in the variation method, we use a trial wave function and uh, find the expectation of h in that trial wave function and find, uh, you know, a wave function which gives the minimum value of the expectation of h in that state. To construct uh, the the trial wave function, we consider a set of z orthonormal single particle states. Now here the labels are phi 1, phi 2, etc. up to phi n. Now 1, 2, 3, etc. correspond to the both, both the orbital and uh, the spin indices of the electron. So we choose them to be orthonormal so that phi i inner product with phi j is equal to delta ij and in terms of the position a representation this is integral of dr phi i star r phi j r is equal to delta ij. So inner product of phi i with phi i is simply 1. Now the trial wave function is chosen as psi 1 etc up to z is the product of phi 1 r 1 etc up to phi z r z. Then the expectation of the Hamiltonian in the state psi uh, is given by uh, the inner pro in the matrix element or the expectation of H in the state psi, which is given by this integral, integral dr1, etc. up to drz, then phi1 star r1, etc. up to phi z star rz, then the Hamiltonian is written like this, then phi1 r1 etc. up to phi z r z. Now we can take the sum over i outside 
Now for each HRI, uh, we see that all other integrals involving say phi1, r1, phi2, etc. and all, except for ri, the terms involved are say phi1 star r1 and phi1 r1 and integral over r1 if i is not equal to 1. So for any state, for any uh, particle kth electron where k is not equal to i, uh, the integral over rk in, will be something like this. Integral over drk, phi star k rk, phi k rk. Now because these states are normalized, that integral will be equal to 1. Now for ri though, we have an additional term hri here. So that integral will be integral dri phi i star ri hri phi i r. Similarly, in the second term involving this, for all r case where r k is not equal to i or not equal to uh, not equal to i or j, the integral involving r k will be exactly like this, and that integral will be equal to one. And for uh, i and j, so we have this term over here. And that integral will be dri drj phi i star ri phi j star rj v ri rj phi i ri phi j rj. Now all these terms become 1. And now it gets simplified to the following form. Sum over i equal to 1 to z integral over dri phi i ri h ri phi i ri plus half sum over i not equal to j dri drj phi i star phi j star rj v r i rj and phi i r i rj. Now we need to minimize this e psi over all possible variations of uh, say phi 1 etc up to phi z. But now phi 1 uh, the, the set phi i are not independent. Variation cannot be independent and they have to satisfy this normalization condition that their integral of their mod square is equal to 1. So minimization with, uh, you know, with uh, constraints can be done using the method of Lagrange multipliers. So first we consider the change in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian when we change each of the phi i's to say phi i plus delta phi i. Or equally, we can consider uh, the change in the complex conjugate phi i star going to phi i star plus del phi i star. So then, taking uh, the change in E, so delta E is equal to, so we have the change given by uh, uh, taking a derivative of this part. So del phi i star, then the other remaining the same. Now over here, in the second part, we have sum over ij phi i star and phi j star. So uh, the variation uh, in first order now involves del phi i star phi j star plus phi i star del phi j star. So considering this, the variation in E can be written in this form. So the second part has del phi i star phi j star plus phi i star del phi j star v r i r j phi r i phi j r j. Now this second part can be modified this way. So that is d r i d r j phi i star r i r i del phi j star r j v r i r j phi i r i phi j r j. Now I can interchange Ri and Rj. So it's a relabeling in which I call Ri Rj and Rj Ri. That is okay because Ri and Rj are integration variables. It doesn't matter which we which name we call them with. So when we do that, so this becomes delta phi i star Rj and this becomes uh, sorry phi i star Ri and this becomes uh, say
uh, sorry we also have to include here sum over i not equal to j okay so when we do that we also have to uh, change i to j so in that case uh, this quantity will become del phi j star rj will be replaced by ri and we also interchange i and j that also doesn't matter because you know the summation over ij uh, will be unchanged if we call ij and j i still the summation variable so when we do that also we have this becoming del phi i star ri and this becoming phi i will be changed to j so phi j star rj and similarly over there and v r i r j become v r j r i so now this is equal to uh, this integral with v r i r j and that is because v r i r j equal to v r j r i because what is the form of v r i r j and that is given by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught 1 by r i minus r j changing r i interchanging r i and r j doesn't change the potential And therefore, del, uh, so now this is exactly same as this first term. And putting that together, we have del E psi is equal to uh, uh, this particular equation, where I can take del phi I star outside, and the other terms are taken accordingly. When E psi is minimum, del E should be equal to zero. So that means whatever is over here can be set equal to zero. Now the constraint equation says that integral dr phi i star r phi i r equal to 1. That is it is normalized. Now variation in phi i will replace this by del phi i star and the variation here is 0 because 1 is a constant. So this is the equation obtained from the uh, constraint. Now we multiply each of this equation for each i with uh, a Lagrange multiplier epsilon i then sum over i running from 1 to z and subtract this from this equation and the resulting equation is this now since we have already induce, introduced these Lagrange multipliers to take care of the constraint we can set the coefficient of del phi i star to be 0 and that means the term within this angle, uh, this curly brackets is zero. So that is exactly this. Now, which is the same as the Hartree equation that we have derived earlier. Now, using equation 11.1, .1, where we have an expression for epsilon i, back in the expression for e psi, this one, this final equation, a little bit of rearrangement shows that E minimum, that is the best estimate for uh, the, uh, the ground state using the variational calculation is simply sum over i running from 1 to z epsilon i minus this factor, which is the same as the one that we got earlier. 